um, main CME activity uh, for this year uh, from the uh, from this council. Uh, so Sri Lanka Association of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics uh, has not been uh, uh, there for a long time, unlike the College of Dermatology. So we were established in 2015, and so we are a young association uh, consisting of most of the clinical pharmacologists uh, in the all medical faculties in the uh, country, as well as all other uh, uh, those who are uh, interested in, in uh, clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. Uh, today is another important day uh, because uh, uh, this is uh, the, today, that is uh, 4th of May, uh, has been uh, declared as the uh, World Smart Medication Day by the world body of the clinical pharma, world body of the pharmacologists. Uh, that body is known as International Union of um, Basic and Clinical Pharmacology, uh, shortened, uh, shortened for IUFA. Uh, and I'm also happy to uh, inform you that uh, just uh, this month, or just last month, we uh, got membership of the, our association was accepted for membership of the IUFA. So IUFA started celebrating uh, World Smart Medication Day uh, from 2021. Uh, and we, our association has been having various academic activities coinciding with this World Smart Medication Day and uh, various aspects pertaining to pharmacology uh, is uh, conducted uh, to uh, inform uh, the academic, uh, inform the uh, clinicians and academic bodies uh, in on aspects related to pharmacology. So today, actually, IUFA webinar is uh, held uh, starting from three thirty, and this year they are um, this year they are uh, this thing is uh, their topic is uh, called personalized medicines. Um, so you can join that uh, webinar also starting at three thirty uh, from our time. Uh, right. So I think we will now get on to uh, what we plan for today. Uh, so today we are going to. Uh, so we thought this year we will have uh, uh, various uh, CPD activities jointly with relevant colleges. So this will. Uh, this is aimed at uh, maintaining contacts and collaborations with our. Uh, respective uh, with our other uh, colleges and also to uh, impart knowledge relevant to uh, clinical pharmacology in the trainees who are training in these respective disciplines. Um, so therefore, I'm very happy that we have uh, uh, got the College of uh, Sri Lanka College of Dermatology uh, collaborating with us today for this uh, event. And I would like to um, invite Dr. Chandani uh, Udagedara uh, to make a brief introductory uh, remark on this uh, webinar that we have planned for today. Thank you. Over to Chandani. Thank you, Professor Galapati, for inviting us. First of all, uh, Actually, we must thank the president and the council of Sri Lanka Association of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics for giving us this opportunity to participate in your prestige event. Uh, actually, toxic epidermal necrosis is a severe form of cutaneous drug reaction, which has 25 to 30% of mortality. Hence, the early diagnosis is very important to prevent morbidity and the mortality. So main points in the management is the uh, stopping the culprit drug as soon as possible. And it is best managed by the dermatologist. Uh, and uh, there is a genetic predisposition with uh, uh, some viruses uh, considered, especially HIV virus considered as a provocating agents. Uh, and actually during corona epidemic, we had increasing number of cases of toxic epidermal necrolysis. So I think this expert panel of speakers will update us on uh, current trends in the toxic epidermal necrolysis. Once again, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity and, uh, the, and the collaboration. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Chandani for, for that brief words of introduction. Uh, yes, so we will uh, now get on with our uh, academic program. So the we to start off this program, we have a, a case presentation by one of the 
trainees in uh, clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. We now have a um, postgraduate program uh, leading to board certification in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. And uh, so they are uh, going through a training program uh, jointly uh, in uh, medicine uh, as well as pediatrics and other relevant subspecialties. So um, Dr. Sobana is uh, our third trainee in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics leading to board certification. So uh, I would like to invite now Dr. Shobana uh, to uh, present the uh, patient, uh, a patient with a rash. Over to you, Sobana. Meda? Thank you, Madam, uh, for the nice kind word. And uh, good afternoon, all of you. It is a privilege to me to be here today with the expert panel, and uh, I am uh, a trainee in clinical pharmacology. So it is a great opportunity to me to present. Uh, and I am Dr. Shobana, Senior Registrar in Clinical Pharmacology. Today, I am going to share with you a story of a child who is with a rash. So let me introduce uh, the child to you. He's Master V, uh, eight-year-old and six-month-old school-going boy from Khakavatta. He presented with us for the high-grade fever for six days and generalized erythematous rash for four days. He was transferred from Kahavata Base Hospital to Lady Ridgeway Hospital on 1st of uh, March. And he has a history of retinoblastoma at the age of one year and six months. And he underwent treatment for that. But now at current situation, he is free of tumor. And he was apparently well after the treatment. And 24th uh, February 2023, he developed a high-grade fever. It is intermittent, associated with chills, and there's no rigors. And also, he complained of cough, but there's no associated shortness of breath on the day first. And uh, mother gave uh, paracetamol uh, the first day. The fever was responded uh, first day to the paracetamol. The second day, they went to the uh, general practitioner and he prescribed the following drugs, the paracetamol, famotidine, citrosine, omeprazole, and pretisolone. And after took the first dose of all drugs, after six hours, the child developed uh, ulcer in the tongue and cracked lips. Uh, and also he complained uh, redness of eye. It was painful and tearfulness. And also uh, he developed uh, erythematous rash. Initially it was papules. Then within 24 hours, it is turned to blisters and uh, it was uh, spared the scalp, palm and feet. And he also complained, cough and spewed up, but there's no hemoptysis and the child has difficulty in breathing at rest. And also the child complained of uh, dysuria, but there's no hematuria and his urine output also was normal. Uh, so, and he has abdominal pain and watery stool. It was seven to eight times per day, but there's no associated blood and mucus in the uh, stool. Uh, he didn't have uh, malina. The mother denied the malina, but he has vomiting also. It was seven to eight times a day, but there's no hemoptysis. And the uh, other than uh, this uh, child, other systemic in, in, uh, inquiry was normal. And the third day of the illness, the child was admitted uh, to the base hospital, Khakavatta, where this treatment was given.
he has a history of retinoblastoma at the age of one and a half years and it was diagnosed and he underwent a six cycle of chemotherapy and laser therapy and uh, he was follow up every six months in Maharahama hospital but at the moment he doesn't have any active tumor. Uh, he underwent examine under anesthesia of eyes but there is no uh, not known allergy to food or drugs. Uh, the uh, birth history was uneventful and development uh, was appropriate to the age. And the family history is a product of non consanguineous married child. It's the fourth child of the family. There's no family history of the similar illness or no family history of malignancy. The, the drug history, I was mentioned the drugs earlier that prescribed by the general practitioner other than that, there's no, uh, not on any other medication the child was on. There's no herbal medication. The last vaccine at 50 years as EPA shadow. <clears throat> uh, his uh, father, his father, child father is auditor and the mother is a homemaker. He's a food uh, going child and the mother's insight of the disease was good and her concern about the recurrence of the disease and the expectation to cure from the illness and uh, the long last health life. This is the summary of the uh, history. The day one, uh, he has a high grade fever and cough. Then day two, the medicines from the general practitioner. After six hours, he got uh, the rash uh, involved the mucous membrane. And also he admitted the third day to the local hospital and transferred to Lady Ritchie Hospital at day six. Uh, this is the temperature chart uh, from the admission to the Lady Ritchie Hospital Ward 9. The initially, uh, he has the high fever, then in between, he has uh, fever spikes. Then weight and height is appropriate to the age. And he's on exam uh, to the uh, at the day six. He's looking ill. He's dyspneic, and the uh, SPO to the room air is ninety five percent age, and he's febrile. And uh, this is the picture I got it from the internet uh, because the ethical consideration I couldn't uh, put the child's picture. So he has the bilateral conjunctivitis with pearl and discharge. Also, he has cracked lips. Uh, and uh, the skin, he has uh, uh, multiple area of blisters uh, involving the 30% of body surface, spared scalp, farm and feet, and uh, the eye and oral cavities also were involved, and Nikolovsky's skin also was positive. So the cardiovascular system examination is tachycardic. The blood pressure is appropriate to the age and capillary refilling time is less than two seconds. So respiratory, he's, a, he's tachypneic and but there's no labored breathing. Uh, AIN is equal to both sides and vesicular breathing, hurt, wrong eye and crepitation bilaterally. The abdomen is soft and mild tender, other than that no uh, abnormality was found. And nervous system examination also was normal. So let me summarize about my child who is a master we, eight year and six month old child uh, who is a uh, school going from Kahawat uh, with a past history of retinoblastoma at the age of one and a half years, now presented with high grade fever for six days and have uh, uh, generalized erythematous rash, which was started papules and then turned to uh, blisters after the six hours of the following medications. Uh, and uh, there are uh, no history of organ failure, but there are systems involved such as the genital urinary system, respiratory system, and uh, skin, and also the uh, uh, GI system. And of the examination, he's ill looking and febrile and dyspneic. 
So uh, when we are looking to the differential diagnosis, the first differential diagnosis is Steven Johnson syndrome because after the medication, the child develops rash with uh, involving the skin and the mucous membrane and all the, although the systemic uh, manifestations also were there. Other differential diagnosis uh, also uh, I earlier we thought. So uh, when uh, the child uh, after admission to the Lady Ritvia Hospital Ward 9 uh, high, dependency, high dependency unit, the first uh, available uh, this uh, blood, uh, venous blood gas was done and it shows the hypoxia and then full blood count was uh, done uh, uh, serially. And the first count and first two count was source that WBC, the blood, white blood counts low with the uh, leukopenia. Uh, but later on, it was uh, normalized. And the 12th of March, the platelet was high. And later on, he has a low hemoglobin. Uh, it may be due to some occult uh, bleeding without our knowledge uh, and also the nutritional part uh, also there. But uh, uh, there's no eosinophilia throughout the uh, illness. This was the blood picture was done on the 1st of March that shows uh, the vi white blood count changes due to the viral infection. Other counts are normal. Cell lines was normal. And uh, this is the renal function test. Uh, initially, the sodium was uh, uh, normal in the up, uh, lower limit, uh, the one, uh, 135.1. And later on 12th, it has come down to the lowest 122. Slowly, it increased uh, to the normal when the child was discharged. This may be due to the skin loss. So the serum osmolality was also low, but the urine sodium was normal. That indicated it is not a, a renal loss. Then in, uh, inflammatory markers that was uh, uh, increased marginally in CRP, uh, C-reactive protein, and ESR. Other uh, in the liver function test, other than the low albumin, uh, there's no other uh, uh, derangement of uh, uh, liver function test, otherwise normal, other than the low albumin. This may be because of uh, inflammatory markers and ongoing uh, reduced albumin production by liver. Other than this investigation, blood culture, chest X-ray, and uh, random blood sugar was normal. Then 13th of March, the child uh, complaining of uh, pain and swelling of the right side Submandibular region follow that uh, the ultrasound neck uh, of uh, scan was done. It shows the sub right side submandibular CL adenitis. It's the known complications of uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. And uh, uh, actually, management is uh, discussed uh, with the consultant dermatologist. This uh, the patient was admitted to the ward 9A on 1st of uh, March, and he was diagnosed to have a uh, Overlap syndrome uh, and uh, with uh, discharge to home with uh, after successful treatment on 27th of March. So these are the prognostic score for the Steven Johnson syndrome. The child have two score out of uh, seven, and the mortality rate according to this score is around 12 percentage. And this is uh, another score, ABCD10. It was source only one score, uh, and it also source the mortality rate are less than 10 percentage to this particular style according to this score. So uh, that's all about my presentation. Yeah, I am uh, thankful to Sri Lanka Association uh, of Clinical Pharmacology and Pharmacology President and uh, all our members. Thank you so much for the opportunity gave to me to the press. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Sobana, uh, for, for that uh, comprehensive presentation of the patient uh, uh, who presented with this uh, rash. Uh, I would like to now welcome uh, Dr. Kosala Karunaratna, who is the a consultant pediatrician uh, who managed, uh, who was uh, under whose care this ch child was admitted uh, to LRH. Uh, so um, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Kosala Karnaratna, consultant pediatrician, to give your comments on, on this patient, uh, uh, Kosala, as a uh, pediatrician uh, managing the patient. Thank you. Over to you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. All yeah, right. Uh, first of all, uh, first and foremost, I must thank Sri Lanka Association of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, and our uh, registrar, senior registrar, Dr. Chobana, for that excellent presentation. And uh, uh, re regarding Stephen Johnson syndrome and the tint spectrum is definitely a pediatric emergency that we see in practice. So actually it's a dreaded emergency. And uh, I mean, as pediatricians outstation, we, uh, I have, uh, as a pediatrician, I have seen several cases out in outstation and in the tertiary center, I'm fortunate to manage these cases with the, our in-house dermatologists. So they are a great uh, strength for us in managing such cases because they can be very, very complicated as you saw in this case. So uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome and the 10 spectrum, usually they present with a rash, like, like in this uh, child, although this child had some mucosal involvement preceding the rash, the rash is the one that most of the children can initially present with. So as you know, Rashes are very common in children, is the in fact the bread and butter of pediatrics. So, whenever a child comes with a rash, uh, I think uh, people should uh, keep uh, 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 Stephen Johnson's and the drug reactions as a uh, differential diagnosis. And as you know, rashes are mainly due to viral illnesses in pediatric practice, like I mean, adenoviruses, uh, your other common virus, all the common viruses can cause a rash. Uh, some of these viruses can cause mucosal involvement as well. Like, like in adenoviruses, they can cause a conjunctivitis. That there's epidemic going on at the moment. And also, there are some serious conditions that can come with mucosal involvement. Like, as uh, Shobana mentioned, uh, your toxic uh, shock syndromes, your Kawasaki diseases. And miss see that was following Corona, we used to see similar sort of presentations, but the difference is it's a non perulent conjunctivitis they get. So here, here in Stephen Johnson, it's mostly perulent. And uh, so, so in Stephen Johnson is commonly, I mean, I won't go into detail of the etiology and the management. I think our uh, dermatologist is going to go into depth. So, but it's usually commonly due to infections and drugs. But in children, it follows mainly uh, infections, but it can follow drugs as well. Of the drugs, we dread anti-epileptics. In fact, now, most of the Stephen Johnson's I have seen followed carbamazepine. Uh, and uh, in fact, I am very cautious when starting carbamazepine. I even go to the length of if I am to start carbamazepine to get a neurologist involved in uh, seeing whether there is an alternative available. I nearly lost about two children due to Stephen Johnson's starting carbamazepine. So fortunately, there are now genetics uh, and HLA patterns uh, identified. I'm sure that will be discussed. Where HLA pattern will give an indication uh, whether the carbamazepine or some of the other drugs uh, uh, also can be uh, incrementing factor. We used to do the uh, HLA pattern at LRH, but at the moment we can't do it. We couldn't do it in this child, but I have done in some other children in the past. So I won't take much short, much of your time. Uh, I think uh, just the pediatric perspective is uh, initial diagnosis and, and, and in a child with a rash, look for mucosal involvement and keep a high degree of suspicion and, and, and get the dermatologist involved 
very soon because uh, they are invaluable in the management of a child Stephen Johnson 10 spectrum. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kosala Karnaratna, for giving us the overview of uh, uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrosis as uh, experienced by a pediatrician. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution to this thank webinar. Hope you. we will stay on uh, for the end of the uh, program uh, because there may be some questions by the audience. Thank you. I would like to now invite Dr. Chandani Udagidara to uh, introduce the, uh, the speaker from the College of Dermatology. I welcome Dr. Shriyani Samaravira and thank her for accepting our invitation. And over to Chandani uh, to introduce Dr. Shriyani Samaravira. Yeah. Dr. Sriyani Samaravira is the consultant dermatologist currently working in uh, Lady Ridgeway Hospital, Colombo. Uh, she is the president elect, uh, next uh, president elect uh, Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists, and uh, she is the chairman of uh, the main event uh, we are going to organize in October, uh, South Asian Regional Conference of Dermatology. And also, she was the secretary for the Board of Study in Dermatology un until recently. And uh, she's a very good teacher and uh, good clinician and very active member of our college. Uh, so without much ado, over to you, Shriyani. Thank you, Dr. Chandani. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Chandani for uh, mediating this event, and I would like to thank Professor Galapati and uh, and the team for arranging this uh, event. Um, yeah, so, so this is a this is actually a very important. Yeah, so this is a very important um, case actually in pediatric dermatology, not only in pediatric dermatology, even in adult medicine, uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrosis uh, spectrum is a very important one and uh, mortality and the morbidity is very high with long-term sequelae, uh, especially in cases of pediatrics, it's really challenging. Um, so uh, uh, before we discuss about the causes uh, management, I would like to briefly go through the um, core little bit about the Stephen Johnson syndrome, and then we will go uh, discuss about the causes and the diagnosis. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Kasun Jayasing of the Registrar in Dermatology at NHSL to uh, start with the um, uh, discussion. Thank you, over to you, Kasun. Uh, thank you very much, dear madam. Uh, First of all, I would like to uh, uh, thank the Sri Lanka Association of uh, Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, the Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists, and uh, my mentor, Dr. Shriyani Samarivir, for giving me this valuable opportunity. I hope that you can uh, see the presentation now. Uh, so uh, this was the initial photograph of the uh, patient Dr. Sobana was uh, talking about. So uh, this patient presented with this uh, uh, necrotic lesions over the body and the first diagnosis, uh, the possible diagnosis that uh, came to into our mind was HGS10 overlap. Uh, so we were, we will be talking about it now. So the Steven Johnson syndrome and the toxic capital uh, necrolysis are uh, very rare and active life threatening mucocutaneous diseases and uh, they both represent actually a uh, a clinical spectrum. On the one hand, uh, we have the SJS, and the other hand, we have the 10. And in between, we have the uh, SJS 10 overlap. So, uh, so rather both are uh, the same identical process, but uh, they only differ uh, by the percentage of epidermal detachment. So the etiology is more or less the same. So uh, they can be uh, classified under SCAR, so severe cutaneous adverse uh, reactions. And uh, it is said that it is a type 4 hypersensitive reaction. Here, there is extensive uh, keratinocyte, say, say, sorry, extensive keratinocyte uh, cell death, which will lead to separation of uh, significant areas of the skin at the, epiderm at the uh, dermal epidermal junction. So regarding the epidemiology, uh, this is, uh, these figures are for children. SJ is uh, 
the incidence about uh, around six uh, as, the, as the figures you can see 6.3 for uh, 100,000 patients uh, and uh, normal population and SGS 10 overlap around 0.7 and 10 around 0.5. So in the pediatric population, uh, so the 11 to 15 year olds are have the uh, most highest recorded incidence. And uh, the one of the reasons behind this is uh, with, the, with the age, uh, we tend to give more frequent drug prescriptions as well as uh, uh, different the ch ch children will get more comorbidity. So it will uh, modify the drug effects. So uh, the risk factors uh, are like uh, slow acetylators. That means that uh, they, they metabolize the drug at a slower rate and immunosuppressions like uh, HIV and lymphoma. So it is said that uh, patients with HIV, they have a thousandfold risk of uh, developing SGS and pain and uh, concomitant administration of radiotherapy and uh, anticonvulsions. Uh, and uh, regarding the mortality rates, uh, 10 uh, children in children, uh, if uh, there's a 25 to 50% age of mortality rate and SGS approximately 5%. And uh, the highest mortality is recorded uh, in children between uh, uh, up to five years with uh, toxic epidemic necrolysis. So uh, there is actually some uh, specific uh, HLA alleles are more prone to develop the disease. For example, HLA-B uh, 1502, uh, that's in Asians, uh, they, when they expose to carbamazepine, they have a uh, higher chance of getting the SGSN10 and uh, in countries like, uh, as, uh, in countries like uh, USA, uh, as previously so also stayed even in Sri Lanka so we have we can screen the child uh, if uh, if we are uh, going to start uh, these medications so there are some uh, other alleles as well so uh, regarding the causes uh, especially in children uh, around 50 percent uh, count uh, for infections so like uh, HSV mycoplasma pneumonia upon the infections again 50 percent of cases and other causes even Varicella sister virus, AB virus, CMV, PAR virus, adenovirus, uh, sometimes some say even HIV, they can also cause SGS 10. So that's a difference uh, with, uh, compared with the elderly population. So in the elderly, uh, most of the, uh, the majority of causes are caused, uh, majority of causes is caused by drugs. Uh, and he also drugs, vaccinations, uh, graft versus source disease, and also some account for uh, the idiopathic category. So these are the commonest drugs uh, causing HJS10 in children and young people. Here we have uh, antiepileptics and uh, NSAIDs and uh, antibiotics as well. Uh, so regarding the pathogenesis, uh, it is in a nutshell and uh, there are several mechanisms, but uh, this is most one of the most widely accepted one. Uh, and this is regarding drugs basically. Uh, now, when a drug is exposed uh, to the uh, to a patient with uh, who has some predisposing factors, uh, a specific immune reaction to the drug or one of its metabolites will occur in the patient. So, uh, as a result, uh, there's interplay of cell types and cytokines. It's still, uh, it is uh, remains to be totally defined, and there is expression of uh, cytolytic molecules like the fast ligand. Uh, on keratinocytes, and uh, there are some uh, molecules such as uh, granulocy granulycine uh, from cytotoxic T cells, NK cells, and NK T cells. So, finally, uh, this fast ligand and granulocytein mediated uh, apoptosis of keratinocytes occur, and subsequently, there will be uh, epidermal necrosis and detachment. Uh, so, uh, Regarding the classification, the extent of uh, skin necrolysis must be carefully and correctly evaluated. Uh, the rules characteri characteristically used to evaluate the surface area of thermal burns are appropriate for this patient purpose. However, uh, in adults, we can use the uh, rule of nines, but uh, in children, we have to uh, uh, use uh, some charts like the London uh, Broad charts. And, uh, the measurements uh, should include uh, not the, just the erythematous area, it should include uh, detached and detachable epidemics. Uh, that means uh, the positive Nikolsky sign.
so this is a patient uh, which uh, uh, this is photo courts of uh, Dr. Sriani, madam, and uh, this is a patient with uh, patients who had exposed to carbamazepine. As you can see, there are some uh, necrotic areas of the torso, which I will be talking about the clinical features in a moment. And uh, this is uh, another patient we encountered a few uh, weeks back here at LRH. Uh, possibly the culprit uh, drug was uh, uh, ibuprofen. Uh, Shriani Madam will be talking more about this patient in her section in the management of uh, these patients. So uh, the uh, previous thing I told about, uh, uh, we have to classify, uh, as I said, it is a clinical spectrum. We have one at the one end is yes and other in 10. So uh, if less than 10% of wood surface area is involved, uh, we classify it as Stephen Johnson's and uh, between 10 to 30 percent it is the uh, intermediate category that is the sgs10 overlap and uh, more if it is uh, if the board surface area more than 30 percent is involved uh, we categorize under uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis so uh, regarding the clinical features uh, so the child is usually ill and there will be a uh, prodromal symptoms like fever malaise headache cough stinging eyes pain upon swallowing even. This uh, thing is these cutaneous manifestations can precede the onset of cutaneous lesions uh, about uh, one to three days, but uh, up to even seven days, some say. And the skin lesions first appear on the trunk, spread into the neck, face, and the proximal uh, upper extremities. However, the distal portions of the arms as well as the legs are relatively spared, but uh, the palms and soles can be an early site of involvement. So as here you can see, uh, around 90% of patients will have uh, involvement of mucosy. So, uh, and uh, that is uh, sometimes we say that uh, at least uh, if we are going to classify a patient with SGS10, there should be at least uh, two of, uh, there should be uh, two of two mucosal surfaces involved. So, because uh, when the eyes and the genital regions are involved, uh, the patient the patient will complain of these symptoms like photophobia and painful micturition. So, uh, this is another patient, uh, uh, a girl uh, who, who was given, uh, who was prescribed with uh, cotrimoxazole. And here you can see the eye involvement and there is some uh, crusting over the lips. Uh, so this patient was managed as Stevens Johnson syndrome, and here, as you can see, uh, regarding the lesions, uh, initially, uh, one thing the patient will also complain of uh, tenderness uh, of the skin. Uh, when we touch the patient, they will complain of a severe pain, and uh, the initial lesions are like uh, erythematous, red, and uh, with time, uh, and they. Polis. At this stage, uh, when the lesions are erythematous, uh, the clinician must think whether that uh, this patient will uh, go into, uh, will progress to 10 and further uh, because uh, the progression will be very rapid. So after that, the lesions be, uh, take a characteristic uh, uh, gray hue and uh, here some patients will develop uh, atypical target lesions. Uh, now, uh, atypical target lesions are seen here, but uh, some uh, diseases like uh, erythema multiforme, they will have uh, typical target lesions which have three concentric lesion, uh, rings. But here, you will only get only two. With, with, the, uh, with the severity of the illness, uh, these lesions uh, tend to get uh, bullet. They will get uh, bullet with the extensive uh, epidermal cell necrosis. So uh, here the skin resembles a wet cigarette paper as it is pulled away by trauma, often revealing uh, large areas of raw and bleeding derms, uh, which is referred to as cold. Uh, so uh, actually, on the other hand, uh, when we uh, apply a tangential uh, mild pressure, the skin will uh, peel off. So this is actually the uh, positive Nikolsky sign. So, uh, because of this, actually, these patients should be uh, carefully handled. Uh, usually, the blisters are flaccid, and uh, but however, if the palms and soles are involved, uh, they are they will get uh, tense blisters. 
Um, so regarding the diagnosis, it is basically a, a, a it is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, so we have to uh, need a detailed medical uh, history, including all new medications, vaccines received. Uh, so usually, uh, when we uh, uh, talk about the uh, inciting agent, around uh, the skin lesions will develop around one to three weeks after after the uh, triggering factor. But up to a, some sometimes like aromatic uh, anti convulsions they can uh, they can have a more uh, bigger window period like uh, around eight weeks so a careful history is the art is utmost important and uh, usually a skin biopsy is not required for the diagnosis but uh, if the clinician is uh, in doubt we can do a skin biopsy which will so show uh, full thickness epidermal necrosis uh, scanty uh, lymphocytic infiltration of the uh, dermis and uh, subepidermal uh, bullae as well. Uh, so for this purpose, we can do a um, cryo cryostat uh, biopsy, and uh, we have to exclude the inf differential diagnosis, and we have to in investigate for potential infectious infectious etiologies, uh, such as the microplasma pneumonia can give uh, something called the MIRM or the uh, microplasma in pneumonia induced rash and mucositis. And we have to also investigate the triggering role of HSV, mycoplasma, uh, chlamydia infections as well. Uh, so uh, differential diagnosis, uh, there's a whole list as also as uh, Dr. Sobana also described. So some of these uh, can be uh, differentiated from uh, the clinical uh, manifestations, even sometimes biopsy as well. So these uh, two cases, uh, this is a patient with Kawasaki disease. Here the patient, uh, photo of Sriani, madam, and uh, here the patient will have conjunctival suffusion, uh, but uh, we can't see any necrotic skin elsewhere, and the patient will have more or less uh, something called the uh, chapped lips, uh, not uh, hemorrhagic crust that we see in SJs, and the patient will, uh, uh, we will see sometimes a strawberry tongue, and uh, here's a case of staphylococcal spotted skin syndrome, Again, the patient will uh, present with uh, irritability and fever. And uh, here, the, uh, there is a positive Nicholson Nicholson sign, but the epidermal detachment is more superficial. So we can't uh, see the dermis here, actually. So this is actually the epidermis again we see here. And uh, there is a periodificial furrowing in this patient. So uh, regarding furthermore about the investigations, uh, we can perform, the, uh, we have to, perform a, a differential ser different serological test and PCR for diagnosing infections uh, like HSV, varicella, EBV, mycoplasma pneumonia, as uh, I already mentioned, and we have uh, two cytokine de determination, granulation expression in cytotoxic T cells, and granulation B, B production by Elispot assay, interferon gamma levels, the granulizing rapid test uh, and also the Alton score. I think uh, that would be discussed more uh, thoroughly later. And uh, we can do a lymphocyte transformation test. That's basically we take the uh, blood from the patient and uh, incubate with uh, with the drug, and we see whether there's a expansion of the T memory cells uh, related to that drug. But it is having uh, false positive, uh, false positive, and false negative results. Although controversial, uh, the second statement here. Uh, some say that we can't; it is not worth. But some uh, uh, there is evidence in literature that we can do patch testing and delayed intradermal testing once the acute uh, reaction has uh, resolved. And uh, drug challenges is actually we do not recommend because uh, the patient will. Uh, it is extremely dangerous and the patient will have in a more severe attack uh, with a short period of time if we uh, challenge the patient to the uh, said drug. So uh, regarding escorting, uh, there's a, actually a escorting system to classify the prognosis. Uh, there's a seven, uh, uh, so there are seven criteria which we calculate in 24 hours at, at three uh, and day three, but it, this is not uh, fully uh, validated in children. So the high risk categories, uh, there's patients with this extensive skin loss, high initial scotin, likely medication use, cause, and malignancy, and previous 
cell transplantation uh, and even female sex has a more high risk. So there are complications, acute and chronic, acute complications, the patients will have more superadded infections. They are the massive transeptable fluidos can cause electrolyte imbalances. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is involvement of uh, inhibition of insulin secretion, insulin resistance, which will, uh, the child will become hyperglycemic. So it's just 10, uh, more towards the 10 side, uh, there can be visceral involvement like pneumonia, pulmonary embolisms, GI tract, if the GI tract is involved, there can be GI hemorrhage, hepatitis, tracheal or bronchial erosion, glomerulonephritis, multi-organ failure, and ultimately the child can uh, succumb to death. So late complications, uh, pretty much if the mucose membrane, membranes are involved, the patient will end up having blepharon, conjunctival uh, synanchiae, entropion, in growth of eyelashes, blindness, cute, and in the skin, cute and scarring, Regular pigmentation, eruptive melanocytic nevi, persisting erosions, and so on. Uh, so, uh, so this uh, to wind up my uh, in uh, this is the that patient uh, the uh, patient uh, which I showed at the uh, beginning and which Dr. Sobana discussed. This is at the recovery stage. So, I would like to now uh, give the mic to uh, Shani Madam. Talk about the management. Thank you. Thank you, Kathun. So we will proceed with the management of this patient. Um, actually, in common in the management of Stephen Johnson and Tim, uh, so there is a standard procedure. You need uh, you need to initially assess, then the diagnosis causality should be done, and then the clinical assessment. Uh, stabilization, and then you do investigations. Uh, you have to arrange the definite care setting, fluids, nutrition, and you have to give analgesics, uh, skin care, and all the other mucosal surfaces affected should be given due care, and then immunomodulatory and other pharmacological agents, and the follow-up. So in this patient, when the patient was referred to us, initially we have taken a detailed history as you all are aware, so we couldn't, I mean, uh, we had a doubt about the four drugs given to the patient uh, because at the beginning, there was only the fever and the cough. After Only six hours after taking the medicine, only the child developed actually the lip lesion and within a short period developed all the blistering skin lesions. So right from the beginning, we had, the, I mean, we, we have strongly suspected that this is a, probably a drug eruption and not the not an infective uh, etiology. Um, so we started the treatment as for a drug eruption, actually. Um, so yeah, so these are the standard things we suspect and which Kasun has discussed in detail. Initially, child was stabilized, as you all have seen that there have been some problem with the saturation and oxygen was given initially. And then uh, because of the cough, we have done the nebulization. And now uh, initially we have given IV fluids, but uh, subsequently very little amount of oral sips also added and uh, nutrition mainly started with liquids because child had very bad mucose and involvement and um, difficulty in swallowing. So we managed to, they have referred the patient to us uh, immediately after the admission and ophthalmology referral also done within 24 hours because that is very important. I see eye problem is the most important sequelae which will have long-term consequences. Uh, so culprit drug was stopped and all actually uh, in the management, most important thing is we have to stop all the non-essential medications because interaction with the other medications also will impair the excretion of the drug from the body which, will, um, which can um, persist the symptoms. So uh, maintenance of the ambient body temperature is also important between 31 to 32. So uh, investigation Shobana has discussed. So we have done the basic investigations. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, so it mainly pediatrician, uh, myself and the ophthalmologist were involved in the management, but we had an additional intrap from microbiologist, ENT surgeon and consultant transfusion medicine for HLA phenotyping and the radicals. Uh, we didn't consider ICU care in this patient. Actually, in our setting, even with my experience in Lady Day Digital Hospital, most of these patients we try to keep in the ward um, because with our experience, we feel they are doing better. The 
indications for admission for the, of them to ICU care is usually if they have a cardiovascular compromise or if they really need ventilatory support. Uh, main reason for, uh, for not putting the patient to ICU is because the uh, risk of uh, infection is very high if we put them to the ICU. And in the ward, actually, we can, in, in Sri Lanka, with the hot humid uh, climate, we are very likely to have secondary infection. Uh, so we usually, for all our patients, whenever possible, we try to wash them uh, daily, so which is possible actually only when they are in the ward. And the mother also can be kept with the child. So if it's a very serious condition and child will be very badly disturbed. So we actually prefer, I think, um, um, prefer to keep the child with the mother. So with these reasons, with our experience in dermatology unit at large, and even in for adults, I think all dermatologists would agree, we prefer to keep the children in the ward, uh, children and even adults in the general wards. Um, and really we put them to the ICU, although in the standard practice, they, um, especially the 10 patients, they, uh, with, uh, we all others with high risk category, they try to arrange uh, uh, burns units and in one hand, uh, Arranging the burn unit or the high depend uh, high uh, ICU care difficult for us with our uh, facilities available. So up to now we have been managing these patients in the uh, normal ward successfully. So fluids um, we have continued IV fluids because patient was not taking enough fluids, which was guarded by the urine output and the insensible loss. Um, and we monitored the sodium level. There had been a hyponatremia at one time. This was corrected. And the nutrition was a real challenge in this patient because the mucosal involvement was so bad. Initially, child was taking only liquids for a fair number of time. And there even the, uh, you, we have seen even the albumin also was low at one time. So because child was refusing uh, semi-solids for a fairly long time, um, I think uh, Dr. Kosela and the team arranged special formula for this child. And subsequently, when the oral lesions were healing, we managed to introduce semi-solids also. Uh, so child was given morphine, oral morphine to reduce the pain because he was in more enormous pain with the extensive skin involvement. Um, so when you consider the skin care, actually, uh, we uh, usually give pressure relieving matrices because the friction will make the skin lesions worse. And to measure, uh, reduce the risk of infection, what we do in our setting with poor, I mean, very, um, I mean, limited facilities, what we do is we uh, reduce, the, we keep the patient in a place where there is very, they, I mean, very less chance of uh, infection, acquiring the infection. And we um, ask the ward to uh, autoclave the bed linen as well as the clothes. And a child will be looked after mainly by the mother. We limit the uh, visitors and the nursing also. We uh, always recommend a reverse barrier nursing. For the intact skin, we usually give the emollients. Uh, ideally speaking, if you can have sprays, that would have been better. But since we don't have uh, those at the moment, we are just using the simple emollients. And for the denuded areas, we use the Vaseline cures um, with or without antibiotics. We don't have, I mean, we don't have an access for um, antibiotic impregnated tools uh, uh, in the moment in the hospital. So that is what we have been using. For the badly infected areas, we had topical fusilic acid and mupirocin, um, of course, we have added only on very uh, badly infected areas. Um, so surgical care, we have not considered for this patient. So mouth care is very important. We uh, insisted the mother about the mouth care right from the beginning. Uh, so with the medicines and the other facilities available in the hospital, we initially gave, we gave prednisolone and statin mouthwashes where we incorporate that with an antibiotic also in normal patients. But here, of course, we have not incorporated the antibiotic because of the possible, I mean, doubt about the causative agent. So then uh, we have within a few days time with that, depending on the response, we have added clotrimazole mouthwash because we don't have a mucanazole mouthwashes available at the moment in the country. So steroid oral gels also alternated with the mouth, uh, antifungal mouthwashes. Uh, we encourage the mother to give uh, more uh, fluids which increase the salivation um, and the lips, of course, treated with Vaseline and sophromycin with uh, dexamethasone. And subsequently, when the lip lesions were getting worse, we uh, very, for uh, one or two days, we have given vitamin C, fusidic acid. Eye care, of course, done by the ophthalmologist. I'm not going into details about that care, but they have reviewed the patient regularly. Uh, this 
child actually had a very bad eye involvement, photophobia, star, even right from the very first day, child was not opening the eyes and there was a very, very severe and very slowly improving eye involvement. Uh, genital care, of course, uh, we have uh, done the regular cleaning and the mild antibiotic steroid combinations. Uh, but unfortunately, with all these oral care and the fact that severe mucosal, you know, a child was, I mean, taking mainly the milk and the formula feeds, uh, although we have re we have asked the mother to give uh, this, uh, this uh, lime man orange and those things where I which increase the saliva secretion, a child ended up with subvandibular saladinitis. And at one stage, there was very resistant lip lesions, which were not improving and bleeding very badly. So we had a suspicion about the superadded HSV infection, and we are given orally cyclob with that actually the lip lesions improved very markedly. Uh, so these are the medications we have considered in this patient. So in our setting, what we usually do is uh, we actually give them mainly uh, DEXA IV uh, steroids, uh, dexamethasone in this child. Uh, together with IV IG. We gave IV IG one gram per kg for three days. And at the end of the three days, since the lesions were not, in, not progressing, and this seems to be somewhat um, con controlled, so we have not progressed, we have not continued the IV IG, and even we have not considered the second line drugs like cyclosporine. For the sylaadenitis, after discussing with the microbiologist and the child was seen by the ENT surgeon, and they, uh, with caution, actually, we have added coamoxiclab. Um, and uh, to fasten the healing for all these patients, when they're having a very significant skin involvement, we try to optimize the healing with the oral supplements. So the child was discharged from the hospital after 26 days of hospital stay. So at the time of the discharge, there were only pigmentary changes. Um, the lips and the oral mucosa was slowly, very slowly, but somehow child was taking the solids. I, of course, even at the discharge, there has been very significant photophobia. Uh, I really don't know the exact, I think there, are, I, as far as I can remember, I think there were no corneal epithelial defects, but, um, but child clinically had photophobia. Genitalia, genital lesions were healing. So management on discharge was we gave mainly the emollients for the skin and asked the mother to continue the Vaseline for the lips and supplements also continued for another month. And the medications for the eyes, of course, continued from the eye uh, ophthalmology clinic. Uh, so during the last week follow up, when I saw the child, child had mainly the pigmentary changes only in the skin. There was no significant uh, scarring on the skin because the lesions, erosions are very superficial and only very few areas had the secondary infection. The eye lesions, of course, I am a kind of difficult to come. I, I, I don't know about the exact uh, lesions at that time, but child had very significant photophobia and I asked the mother to give some sunglasses also because he find it very difficult. Uh, oral lesions have healed completely and mother complained of phimosis. Uh, so I referred the patient to the plastic surgeons uh, for, the, uh, for the management of the phimosis. So phimosis is a known complication of C1 Johnson. Um, so a little bit about the eye uh, involvement. Um, Usually 50% of patients, children who develop Steven Johnson or 10 or OLF will have, 50% um, of them will have chronic sequelae die. Even though they don't have significant uh, or the CBI involvement at the, um, during the acute illness, uh, during the follow-up period, they may have eye problems. Mm, yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is another child, uh, uh, we have got at the same time in the ward. You can see the extent of, uh, yeah, you can see the extent of skin uh, the, the This child actually previously well, a 10 year old child who, who was, uh, who developed fever and a cough. And at the same time, mother noticed some redness in the eyes and um, a few red skin lesions. The child was taken to a GP where because of the high fever, in addition to the paracetamol, um, child um, GP has given uh, two, three doses of ibuprofen for the child. Uh, the mother has given the same paracetamol from the same pack previously also over the last uh, uh, two, three weeks time, previously, uh, during the previous two, three weeks time. So she has take, used the same paracetamol. So the cause for the drug reduction uh, 
to be the paracetamol is very unlikely because she has used the same paracetamol even before also. So we thought it may be due to uh, ibuprofen, but we had a doubt about the exact cause because child had red eye and the um, few skin lesions even before the initiation of these medications. So this is the very bad mucosal involvement uh, child had uh, at the beginning. Uh, sorry, uh, during the convalescence. So this particular child, actually, it was a, it was a real challenge because uh, we were not very sure about the drug etiology and the fact that lesions, there had been some lesions before the onset of this thing. And unlike the previous child where the CRP was not very high, so we didn't bother too much about the infective causes. But here the child came with the CRP of 200. We have given the actually we have given the antibiotics to cover the mycoplasma also for this child. Uh, because the cough was also very bad and uh, fever persisted for a while. Uh, but this child during the course of the illness developed secondary sepsis uh, on the skin, uh, leading to fever uh, in a couple of days time. And then we treat, uh, we have added uh, parenteral antibiotics. And in another two, three days time, um, child developed, uh, the uh, child got the exacerbation of cough and then the blood culture was positive for gram negative bacteria. So all these child was treated. Um, so it is actually the second child is more challenging than the first patient because first, but the, so you, you all have seen that body surface area involved is, uh, this is actually the second child is 10 because it is more than 30% of body surface area involved. And the eye involvement is very bad because child had very, Sites, uh, for the eyes so both patients now I mean the second child also discharged two days back from the hospital but I feel both patients will have a, a very significant eye involvement a second patient actually one important thing we have done the mycoplasma antibodies both IgG and IgM were negative uh, so so these two cases actually highlight the um, treatment and the management challenge we face with these patients where the drug history is not very straightforward. I mean, we, we can be even this one, the ibuprofen is a possible factor, but the fact that the child has responded, the fever has responded to uh, acetromycin um, during the course of the illness also uh, raises whether there can be any other infective cause. So, um, and the one other picture we have shown the Stephen Johnson child, that child developed Stephen Johnson to co-trimoxacil given for a urine tract infection. So I think that when there are safer alternatives available, I feel better um, you have to try the safer alternatives because co is a very well known to cause uh, Stephen uh, Johnson syndrome. Um, so with regards to prevention of the Stephen Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrosis, you need to identify the risk factors um, and we need to screen wherever possible uh, before the initiation of the drug. You all know that for Abercover now they are looking at HLA testing. So ideally, uh, again, we should have the facilities to at least wherever possible to do this uh, pre-treatment HLA screening. Uh, and avoidance of concomitant use of other medications also very important because that interferes with the um, drug metabolism and may even uh, increase the chances of severe drug reaction. So in other countries like Thailand, where they use pharmacogenomic ID, where uh, they carry the HLA test in a wallet card type, that type of things are actually very important. So one small thing I want to mention here, there is a proposed new classification for severe drug eruption in children. Um, so according to that, actually what they have done is um, they classify it into two main groups. One is drug-induced epidermal necrolysis, what we call as DEN, where Stephen Johnson, Stephen Johnson 10 overlap and 10 are considered into a single disorder and this is due to the drugs. Second category is infection-related cases typified by severe mucosal involvement and less impression on skin pictures. And this is uh, what we categorize reactive infection mucocutaneous eruption. So uh, this new classification is worthwhile because the treatment of DIN and RIM are different. Uh, this allows us to um, start the patient on antibiotics early uh, in case of infective etiology because the final outcome will, be, um, will depend on the early withdrawal of the medication and aggressive treatment uh, of these patients. Yeah, so these are my references. 
uh, thank you, Dr. Kalapati, uh, for giving us this opportunity to talk to about this uh, very important clinical scenario. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shriyani Samaravira, for that comprehensive presentation on the management of uh, uh, this condition, as well as Dr. Kasun for, for the uh, presentation of uh, several the other patients as well. Uh, we would uh, like to now quickly move on to the next presentation. I would like to uh, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Shalini Sri Ranganathan, my uh, colleague in the department. Uh, Shalini is a senior professor in pharmacology uh, and a, a specialist in pediatrics. And uh, Shalini also uh, is the best person to discuss causality assessment because uh, Shalini's PhD in University of Cardiff was in the area of adverse drug reactions and causality assessment. So over to you, Shalini. And I know Shalini has to uh, leave uh, soon. So if you have any questions for Shalini, uh, Professor Shalini Sri Ranganathan, uh, you can actually submit them during her presentation so she can answer those before she leaves. Thank you, over to Shalini. Uh, we can't hear you. I think you're muted. Thank you very much, the chairperson. I know we are running very short of time. So probably that I will reduce the time of my presentation. So my email address is always available to the participants so they can send the questions or doubts um, over the course of time, so I will respond. So now my duty regarding this webinar is to discuss something about uh, or give an infusion of uh, clinical pharmacology into this nice um, combination of dermatology and pediatric clinical case. So having said that, my title of my presentation is Child with a Rash, Is it an Adverse Drug Reaction? role of causality assessment. So then when you look at it, this is just to everyone would have put some pictures. So this is a picture from Google. So you don't need to worry about that. So just to um, uh, give you the definition of adverse drug reaction, it's a response to a medicine which is noxious and unintended and which occurs at doses normally used in man. So the words which are in the red are actually very important to diagnose that it is an adverse drug reaction. So you can understand harmful, therapeutic doses, non-intended, and it is a response to a medicine. It is not effect of a medicine. However, subsequently, the experts in uh, pharmacovigilance changed the definition of adverse drug reaction, thinking that it is a very restrictive definition. They move to a definition for adverse effects rather than adverse drug reaction, had a very short, nice, beautiful definition. We can put anything under that definition to say that it is an adverse effect. So all unwanted effects of a medicine was pulled to say that it is an adverse effect. So no one can defend to say that it was not noxious, it was not intended, it was not unintended. So therefore, this is, I probably like this definition because it encompasses everything. So I will jump to the pharmacovigilance or the clinical pharmacology aspect of uh, adverse drug reaction or adverse effect. When you are describing an adverse drug reaction, we are expected to describe in several aspects. So I have given those several aspects in this slide. And quickly, I will tell you one by one what we are supposed to do and what is relevant to this case. So the first one, we should know whether it is a type A or type B adverse drug reaction. Type A is actually extension of the normal action of the medicine. So if it is insulin and hypoglycemia, it is type A. If it is penicillin and anaphylaxis, it is type B. The second one is we need to know the frequency. Unfortunately, during post-marketing pharmacovigilance, we don't know the number of adverse drug reactions because reporting is so bad. I don't think even this patient would have been reported as an adverse drug reaction. Second thing is we don't have electronic data of the prescriptions. So like ibuprofen, so many millions kids would have received ibuprofen, but we don't know how many kids would have taken the ibuprofen. So calculating frequency post-marketing is quite difficult, but that during pre-marketing clinical trial, we can calculate frequency of adverse drug reaction. And if it is more than 10%, we consider it is a very common one. We pharmacologists know that there is not a single medicine without a adverse drug reaction. If someone comes and tells you, my medicine is absolutely safe, then it should be a water, right? It can't be a medicine. So you can directly tell the person you are lying. So therefore, as a pharmacologist, most of us know that there is not a single medicine without an 
adverse drug reaction. So if we start to bother about a small rash, small sedation, small diarrhea, people will not prescribe medicine. So therefore, the WHO recommended a definition for serious adverse drug reaction. And what I have given in this slide is actually explain the WHO criteria of serious adverse drug reaction. Then the clinicians who are treating the patients, they are concerned about the patient, not about the pharmacovigilance, which is quite understandable. So they are not going to look whether it is serious or not. They want to know the severity of that adverse drug reaction. It may be serious, it may not be serious, but they wanted to know whether that adverse drug reaction is a mild or moderate or severe. So there is a difference between seriousness and severity. Seriousness is in term of the pharmacovigilance in order to report an adverse drug reaction, in order to tell to the industry that your drug is producing many serious adverse drug reaction, in order to change the labeling, whereas the severity is actually to manage the patient. That is depend on patient to patient and depend on scenario to scenario. Then outcome. So the standard classification of an adverse drug reaction is recovered, recovering, continuing and fatal. Thanks to the clinicians who have managed this child, the dermatologist, ophthalmologist, the pediatrician, and all the team, they have actually made the child to live. So this child falls under the category of recovered. Then the next point about um, system. So you have to classify which system this adverse drug reaction belongs. Sometime back, there was a classification called WHO adverse reaction terminology. When I was doing PhD, that is the one. But after that, these all become a sort of a business, profitable. So access is limited. They have a dictionary called medical dictionary for regulatory activities. A simple researcher cannot access that. You have to pay for this. But adverse reactions are now expected to classify using this MEDRA. But I know the Steven Johnson syndrome falls under skin and mucous membrane category. So the next one is uh, when we are describing an ADR, we need to describe the mechanism also. So as I told earlier, the type A, very simple, it's a normal pharmacodynamics of that drug, propranolol, bradycardia, insulin, hypoglycemia, heparin, bleeding. The other one is the type B, Steven Johnson syndrome falls into type B, penicillin induced anaphylaxis falls into type B, that bizarre, odd, strange, we cannot explain by the mode of fraction of the drug how that produced that adverse drug reaction. So it is mainly patient dependent, not drug dependent. So that is why genetics, you heard when the registrar dermatology presenting, when the consultant dermatologist presenting, you heard about the genetic factors, genetic diagnosis, immunological background, type 4 hypersensitivity. So there was Steven Johnson syndrome for us under type B, unpredictable difficult to prevent, patient dependent, right? And severe than the type A also. So the child under discussion today, if we put all these classification there, system, skin and mucous membrane, seriousness, serious, severity, severe, type, type B, mechanism, you heard a lot about it, but it is a type four, T cell mediated hypersensitivity reaction with genetic predisposition for some medicine like carbamazepine. You heard that. The frequency varies. This is overall not limited to pediatric, I have put there. So it is two to seven per million people per year. But what is given within the bracket is most important. According to the recent statistics, 80% of the Steven Johnson syndromes are related to medicine. So we have to congratulate the efforts of this dermatology team for looking for a good medication history, which is hard to find anyway, whenever they get a patient with Steven Johnson syndrome, because the culprit generally goes to the medicine category and rarely the infectious category. Outcome, as I said earlier, particularly this child is fortunate to come to Lady Ridgeway Hospital. The child survived despite the major outcome of this reaction is supposed to be fatal. Now we will go to the causality assessment. So what do you mean by causality assessment is because these adverse drug reactions are very difficult because they present as the patient present. A person can come with mucosal lesion due to infection also. A person can come with congenitalitis due to infection also. There is no different 
clinical picture for adverse drug reaction. So you cannot just look at and say that is an adverse drug reaction. So it's very difficult. Second thing is in a complex clinical setting, when the patient is taking too many medicines, the patient is having some multi-organ diseases, just going and telling that particular medicine has caused this particular adverse drug reaction is not going to be simple. So they are for the World Health Organization together with all the other pharmacovigilance bodies suggested that we need to have a form of a causality assessment. This is for overall, not for Steven Jensen syndrome itself, a causality assessment to see whether it is a definitely related to drug, probably related to the drug, possibly related to the drug, or unlikely to due to the drug. So this causality assessment is very useful not to individual prescribers or individual clinicians, because they are very focused to save the life of the child. The secondary matter is to see what has caused it in order to prevent further occurrences. But for regulatory authority and the pharmaceutical industry who have to analyze safety of a medicine, they need to come and say the causality assessment. So a pharmaceutical industry, when they see uh, adverse drug reaction occurring with their medicine, they are expected to collect data and do this causality assessment and report to say out of X number of adverse drug reaction, these are probable, these are possible, these are unlikely. And to analyze that, the regulatory authorities also should know this causality assessment. So I have given the uses of this causality assessment here, and I expect this presentation can be uploaded in our website so that you would be able to read that again, even if I am going fast in this presentation. Now, what are the criteria that generally we use for causality assessment? I have not limited this to the Steven Johnson syndrome because you heard the uh, causality assessment of Alder causality assessment for Steven Johnson syndrome, but I am doing it overall. So there are actually four aspects generally we look into. The first is the time factor. So this is not the hen and the egg story. Here the medicine has to come before the event. So therefore the time factor. Second one is the plausibility, biological plausibility, pharmacological plausibility. Right. So therefore, that is what I, you have seen the, when the registrar was presenting. He has put half-life there as one of the criteria. That is because sometimes a medicine having a long elimination half-life. And if you see an adverse drug reaction soon after the medicine, it is little unlikely to be due to the drug. So that is a pharmacological plausibility or medical plausibility. Third, though the fourth important one is because these adverse drug reactions are caused by various other factors, like the team, they have done a lot of investigations to see whether there is an infectious etiology. They also have to look for whether there is any alternative causes for that presentation. So these are the four major assessment criteria when we do causality assessment. And that is summarized in this list. One is we should look whether there is a similar ADR for this medicine in the past. Second series, we had to look what that ADR is. Third one, we had to look the duration. When did you start the medicine and when did you get the reaction? Then you also saw something called D challenge that when the medicine is stopped, whether the reaction is progressing or the reaction is stopping or whether the reaction is actually uh, recovering better. That is the challenge. Other one is called re-challenge, which is ethically not possible. If you suspect ibuprofen as an etiological factor for Steven Johnson syndrome, you cannot go and give the ibuprofen again to the patient to see whether the patient is going to get the rash worse. So the re-challenge is generally not practiced because it is unethical, but accidentally when these all have healed, if the patient has lost the diagnostic card and if the patient doesn't remember anything about this bad event, then a general practitioner, after knowing so many brand names of medicines, might accidentally prescribe the same medicine to the patient. In that case, we might see a re-challenge. Then the most important one I said is the seventh one, the alternative causes. 
So Steven Johnson syndrome actually placed very high in this criteria because alternative causes are less for Steven Johnson syndrome compared to other adverse drug reaction. So that is called background noise is limited. If it is a child comes with a convulsion, then the background noise is so huge that it will be very difficult to assign a causality for that because the convulsion is caused by multiple factors other than the medicine the child would have taken it. So the WHO based on causality assessment classify the causality certain probable possible unlikely conditional and unclassifiable based on sorry these I will come to that later based on five criteria. This is what I always teach the students. So if there are students, uh, maybe I might have been teaching adverse drug reaction for 20 years in Columbia faculty. So if there are students there, you will understand. This is what I teach you. The five WHO causality assessment criteria, timing, de-challenge, literature, alternative causes, re-challenge. And in that, re-challenge is very difficult. So therefore, generally, we end up with these four criteria. So based on that, WHO classify this to certain. If all five of them is positive, it is certain. But unfortunately, fifth criteria, we don't have much. So according to the WHO criteria, we will not be able to say one adverse drug reaction as certain. Second one is the probable. First four are acceptable. Fifth criteria is not available, that is the re-challenge, then the WHO say it is probable. So almost all the adverse drug reaction managed by the clinicians are coming under this category because they will not do a re-challenge. Then the possible alternative explanation. So therefore, if you have a doubt, it might be due to another cause also, then the causality comes down. So that is what in Steven Johnson syndrome, a granulocytosis, so condition like that, background noise is very, very, not very loud. Alternative explanations are limited. So those adverse drug reactions are classified generally as probable. Then the WHO says the three things, you don't need to know that. If you don't have any information about that, it is called unnecessary. If you have uh, some pending data, then it is called unconditional. Uh, and if the reaction has come before the drug, then the WHO says it is unlikely. That's obvious, no? right? That's unlikely. So I always ask the student whether the egg came first or the can came first. But in this, the hen has to come first. So the egg comes later. So it is unlikely, right? Then child under discussion. Now we are coming to child under discussion. Timing, yes. The challenge looks yes. But the next two, previous evidence in literature implicating drug, I will come to that. I have put yes there. Absence of alternative explanation, oh, I have put yes there. So that means all four are fulfilled. Fifth, we can't do. We can go and give one of those four drugs to see whether the child is getting it or not. So therefore, this comes under probable. Then what I did is, there are so many causality disturbance. There are so many causality assessment criteria. So this is the Naranjo criteria, which I used for my PhD because it's easy to use. Generally, when you do PhD, that's the first thing we do. But it's the easiest way of doing something, right? So therefore, I picked it up because it is a retrospectively administrable causality assessment. So I did that also for this case. Again, it is coming as probable. This probable came based on two things. Number one is absence of or less likelihood of alternative causes. Second thing came conclusive reports of the same reaction to the suspected medicine in the past. Using those two only, this causality assessment came as probable. So absence of alternative causes, we listened to it. Right? So the, both registrar as well as the specialists were trying to explain that they in fact looked for a alternative causes and they didn't get that much and considered this as a drug corruption. So we will satisfy that. Then what I did was the literature. The conclusive report is difficult, but I just read in the literature, paracetamol is implicated in one journal. 
not omeprazole, but pantoprazole has been implicated in another article. So now in this digital media, you will get any reaction to any drug if you put a search. This is not the time that we did research where we used to look at the index medicals and search for literature. Now, if you go and put a suggestive ibuprofen and vomiting, you will get positive. If you put paracetamol and anaphylaxis also, you will get positive. Anyway, there are articles implicating paracetamol, implicating pantoprazole, implicating famotidine. So rather than categorizing whether it is a paracetamol, omeprazole, or famotidine, I didn't do for cetricin, but if you do that, that also will be there. It may be antihistamine, it may be used for immunological disorders, but still, if you put a search, you will get that as well. So depending on the literature, I thought this medicine is implicated, at least one of them. So still, the causality assessment, I kept as probable. Okay? Last two slides. Is it a wonderful classification? No. Causality assessment is not a wonderful classification. It is a subjective classification. It needs a lot of information from the reporter. If there is missing data, we cannot do that. If the time of onset is not there, we cannot do the causality assessment. If the details of medication is not there, we cannot do the causality assessment. So much so in Europe, there are about 28 causality assessment criteria. That means there is not a single validated gold standard causality assessment overall. And what the registrar was trying to say, the dermatology, this Alders causality assessment for Steven Johnson syndrome, that also based on the factors that I said, right? Time was there, half-life was there, pre-challenge was there, re-challenge was there, and the notoriety was there. What I said as literature, they have reworded to say notoriety. That means in the past, had there been events like this. So that also derived from this causality assessment. This is a mother causality assessment from the WHO. But then this is an interesting article. If I put the reference, I think all of you go and read that. Here, the leading person, I think the clinical pharmacologist would know that he has given talks to us also, the professor of pharmacology from Oxford, the Aronson. He says, you don't need to do the causality assessment in all the cases. Like if you see a thief stealing um, jewelry and you have a picture of that, then you don't go and do a long investigation to find out whether that is the person who stole the jewelry. So similar to that, what he was trying to say is, you give a vaccine on the deltoid, child get an injection site reaction in the deltoid. It's so obvious that it is the injection related reaction. Now you don't go back and do this causality assessment and come and say it is possible or less likely or certain or probable. So he has given a very nice article that I think the reference is there. We will put the article also in the website. Very interesting to read. He's put the, the robbery as an example and then link the adverse drug reaction to that. Very interesting. I think all of you, irrespective of whether you are a pediatric trainee or whether you are a dermatology trainee or you are a clinical pharmacology trainee, it's like, a, it's like an investigative article. Just go and read this. Very interesting. So he says, before that, sorry. He says, in certain instances, please don't go and do a causality assessment. It looks stupid. That's what he says. You will look like a fool. You give penicillin, patient collapses, anaphylaxis. Now you don't go and say that, look for some alternative causes for that anaphylaxis, right? The thief is caught. You don't need further investigation. So that is the end of my presentation related to causality assessment. But I have an appeal to the clinical pharmacology and therapeutics team. The medicine prescribed by the GP for a child of eight years and six months presented with fever and cough of one day duration, paracetamol, famaptidine, Omeprazole, prednisolone, cetricine. Rather than ourselves taking up this uh, smart medication day, I think we should start encouraging rational use of medicine with GPs. If not, none of our children will have any gastric acid in their stomach because it is the overdose of famotidine and omeprazole. They will end up as a hydrochloridia. Prednisolone will induce gastric juice. Omeprazole and famotidine will reduce the gastric juice. So over to you, the president of Sri Lanka College of Pharmacology and Therapeutics. Take this up, madam. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Shalini, uh, for that uh, very comprehensive and interesting presentation in your usual style. And then also uh, posing a question as well. Of course, you are with, uh, you, you are in the team. And uh, so therefore, I think this is a very important question that actually you have put forward, um, you know, which needs to be addressed. I really do not know how because we have been, you know, working on uh, improving rational uh, use of medicines in the country but i fully agree with uh, your comment that you know giving uh, all these medicines uh, for a uh, you know 6 year or 8 year old child uh, you know is not rational and we can see the consequences that is the most important thing when these medicines are used people do not consider what could be one of the co consequences for a drug you know which uh, 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 that is given not without a proper indication. I mean, if you have, if you need to give something which has a real indication, then you are, you know, accepting the uh, adverse effects of that, right? because then uh, uh, benefits overweigh the risks. But then, when if a drug has been used uh, without a clear indication, and then it can lead to this type of a even life-threatening, um, uh, uh, you know, complication or adverse drug reaction, I think that is uh, something that we need to take seriously into consideration. We have seen instances where, uh, you know, anaphylaxis has uh, resulted uh, in, uh, when, when patients have been given antibiotics uh, without uh, justified reason. Uh, so I think we are actually, uh, you know, um, uh, we have utilized the time that we allocated for this uh, webinar, but if there are any questions, just one or two, we, we can take one or two minutes for that. Uh, for, for the questions. I didn't see any via the chat forum, but I would like to ask Dr. Kosala Karunaratna. Um, now this this child, uh, we, we heard that the child had uh, uh, previous uh, diagnosis of uh, retinoblastoma. And uh, so I, either Dr. Kosala Karunaratna or Dr. Shriyani Samaravira can answer the uh, question, uh, you know, whether there is any association between uh, the retinoblastoma and uh, uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome. Over to you, uh, Dr. Kosala or Dr. Shriyani. Uh, actually, uh, in fact, I wanted to ask that question from uh, uh, Shriyani. Uh, what do you think, Shriyani? Is there? No. No, there is no known association. What about because the chemotherapy you ticks that were given? And no, that was given long time long back. Ago, no, yeah. no, no, very unlikely. If at, if at all, it should occur within a very short period. Very unlikely. And we have never seen an, uh, this type of uh, case scenario. So, very, uh, unlikely. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshani. And also, you were mentioning that there were... Uh, there are long-term consequences, particularly ophthalmic consequences. What yeah. type of long-term consequences uh, do they uh, generally get uh, following Stephen Johnson syndrome? Actually, so apart from these local things where they get ecropion and synblepharin, that is they form various fibrous membranes and those things are most uh, actually the very um, serious ones are they can have corneal ulceration with the epithelial defect occurring at the time of the disease. Uh, which can cause corneal scarring and the blindness. And the worst thing is a uh, lot of these children who, who are relatively okay during the acute stage will develop uveitis in long run and glaucoma, chronic glaucoma, uh, which will impair their vision. So I can still remember one patient, uh, one patient actually, um, postnatal mother develop uh, uh, is Stephen Johnson after giving carbamazepine single dose postpartum for postpartum seizure. Uh, patient came and told us, Doctor, no point. So it's like that. So a lot of these patients will lose their vision. So the eye involvement is about 50%. So we always actually, um, we are very cautious about this eye uh, thing because uh, even these two patients, uh, I, we can't predict about the eye involvement. Still, they are under follow-up from the ophthalmology unit. Uh, the most important thing what we have seen is you need to refer them to the ophthalmology unit as early as possible. Daily review and the very close follow-up by the eye team should be done because we as, and, and Dr. Kosal also will agree with me, uh, we as uh, dermatologists and pediatricians can do very little for the eye because we can't even clean the eye. We can't put the, I mean, we can put the local dressings, but we can't examine the eyes. We have no idea. So 
that is completely dependent on the ophthalmologist. So if the ophthalmology team uh, will have a very important role because in most of the cases, tonic sequelae is mainly due to eye. If the patient recovers, it's the eye main problem. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, we have had a very uh, uh, important and useful uh, 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 webinar followed by a discussion. Uh, I take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, the Sri Lanka College of Dermatology, uh, Dr. Chandani Udagedara, Dr. Sriyani Samaravira, uh, Professor uh, Shalini Sriranganathan, Dr. Kasun, um, and our own Dr. Shobana, who contributed to this uh, 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 webinar and also I must thank Professor Priyanka Ranasinghe and Professor and Dr. Chiranti Lienage who did the background work behind the scenes in uh, organizing uh, uh, this event uh, and I would like to hand over to Dr. Chandani Udagidara also to speak a few words before we wind up the session. Thank you. Over to Chandani. Actually, it was a very interesting and we learned a lot from the pharmacology aspect as well. Uh, so I think uh, in future also, uh, there are a lot of uh, severe drug reactions occurring other than uh, Steven Johnson uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis. Uh, if we have patients, we would be able to uh, get uh, more opinion from you. And uh, uh, if we collaborate, actually, we can uh, prevent developing also through HLA screening and other preventive options. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chandani. Yes, in fact, HLA screen now today, as I said, IUFA World Smart Medication Day, the theme is personalized medicine. So I think some countries are practicing personalized medicine by doing uh, particularly HLA uh, 1502. They do for a uh, carbamazepine, I mean, before starting carbamazepine, I know Singapore does it and uh, uh, even uh, Thailand does it. Uh, but I do not know whether uh, the same kind of frequency is noted in our population because that is mostly, I think, Chinese Asians, whether uh, the South Asians uh, uh, like us, uh, you know, are having higher, uh, uh, you know, uh, incidence with HLA 02, uh, 1502, I'm not sure. So I think that is probably an area that we can look into. And yes, certainly we would be very happy to collaborate with the College of Dermatology uh, in our uh, future academic activities. And we invite you to join with our activities as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, thank uh, again, once again, uh, both of you, particularly Dr. Uh, uh, Chandani Udagidara and Dr. Shriyani Samaravira. I know Chandani is, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Shriyani is the ne uh, next year's uh, uh, president as well as we were informed. So our council goes on for two years. So we look forward to uh, uh, working with you uh, collaboratively with our future activities. Thank you so much. Okay, we will conclude the session. Thank you.